Hi. Hi, Shabir. I'm really sorry. It's Minyon McCulloch here. I'm really sorry about this. We never realized you were that popular. Your fan club is... Me, it's other two speakers. <laughs> I've got Fiona in. I'm just looking for Haroon. Just ask Haroon if he's got in under his name. Is Haroon's iPad label under his name? Just ask Haroon. <laughs> In the waiting room. I just don't know if Haroon is under his name. Or... I just hope he's not under Galaxy or something. <laughs> I need to know what is her room's label on his phone. <laughs> Is it I have an iPad? Has he ever bothered? Has he ever changed his name? Hi, Arun, what's your <laughs> name that you all logged in? Here we go. Here got we got, it, we got, got it. you. We're okay. you in now. Okay. It should be in now. Guys? Okay. So I just. Fiona's in and Shabir is in. We just need to get Mo in as well. Who else? Mo. Mo. What's okay. Mo under? All right. Who's okay. Mo right. under? Guys, I'm just needing some help. What's Mo's name? Yeah. Arun, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. I just need some help, please. What is Mo's name? It's, it's his surname is Archery, and it's Mohandran Archery. Okay, so sorry, I've got three hundred names that I'm just sifting through. So just bear with me. And I'm hoping that he's labelled under Muhammad Archery, because sometimes people are labelled under the name of their iPhone. I saw his name in that way. I'm not hanging around with this fan club in future. <laughs> we thought the president was popular. This is another whole league. Sorry, guys, I'm just really struggling to get Mohammed. It's Mohandran Mo Mohandran Archery. One of the problems is he he was had to leave at half past four. So yeah, I'm really sorry. I'm just trying to get. Yeah, no, no, it's nobody's fault. It's just I, I'm going to have to handle that somehow. But as soon as he's on, we can get going. Well, otherwise, maybe we can. Is it possible to try with him later? Got him. Got him. Got him. Got him. Okay, let's just Great. get him in. Okay, good. good I just want to see, and now I'm going to admit everybody else. Yes. So, how do we do that? Ah, Mo, you there? Can can you unmute? No. Okay, all so the speakers on, guys. <laughs> Mo, you're going to need to leave at, at, at half past four. Yeah, I'm actually running the both meetings at the same time, so I'm listening to them now. Okay. Um, <laughs> All right, guys, thank you very right. much. I'm sorry about the technical issues. We never expected to be this popular, so now I'm going to admit all, okay? Okay. I really hope you don't get thrown off. I've never done this one before. <laughs> I was just saying, I don't know who the popular one is. Okay. Great. Apologies to everybody. We should have everybody. We've got another 300 people back in again. Okay.
Great. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Mignon McCulloch, and I'm here with Beira Rousseau, and we're going to hand over to Haroon Saluji, who's going to be chairing this meeting. Um, thank you, everybody, for your patience. I'm sorry we didn't expect this many people to join us, but it really is good news. And Haroon, over to you. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this, the fourth SAPA meeting. Uh, we're obviously delighted that there are so many people joining. Can I please ask that anyone, everybody mute themselves and also please stop your video. We, we, we only want the, part, the, the panelists to have their videos on. So can I please ask everyone to go to the bottom and actually stop the video if only the panelists should have video. Thank you very much. All right, so let's without much ado get going with this session. I think everybody knows why we're having the session today. It was held at, it was organized at relatively short notice, but it's such a topical issue, the whole issue of should children be going back to school. Our panelists today are three distinguished pediatricians. Firstly, Professor Shabir Mahdi, who I think many of us know, uh, Professor of Vaccinology at WITS, and he's been the go-to person in the media. If anyone, the media wants any comment on COVID, he's been the guy they've got hold of. So we're delighted that Shabir joined us. Our second panelist is Dr. Fiona Kritzinger. And Fiona is a pediatric pulmonologist based at the Christian Barnard Memorial Hospital in Cape Town. And then our final panelist is Dr. Mo Archery, who's an infectious disease specialist at Durban. So the way we're going to do this session is a little bit different from some of the previous sessions. We're not going to have formal presentations from each of the panelists. Instead, I will be raising a number of questions to them, usually first a, a, a primary person, and then I will ask the other two panelists to comment on it. Okay, so without much ado, let's, let's, let's get on with the session. Um, we know why, the session, why this issue is so controversial, uh, because everybody's got a view and the views are so different. So our Minister of Education, Angie Mosineki, wants children to be back, certainly the grade sevens and twelves by, by the first of June. The unions are ready to go to court because they're saying it's not safe to be there. Uh, the parents are very unsure. Sur survey by the ENCA last week suggested that only 25% of parents wanted their children to go to school. The other 25%, 50%. Finally, lots of organizations like Equal Education and others are also saying unless the situation is safe, our children shouldn't get to school. So here's the first question. Can I again ask that anyone who's not a panelist, please mute your mic. So the first question goes to Shabir, Professor Harun, Mahdi. Harun, yes. it's me on here. I'm just going to mute everybody and then can the speakers please unmute themselves, okay? Fantastic, thank you. So Professor Mahdi, the first question is to you. And it's this whole question of what do we know about children? How infectious are they? And if they go to school, what's going to happen? Shabir, okay, can you? So, yeah, so thanks, Arun. So Arun, I think if you allow me, I think we need to take a step back. Uh, and unfortunately, much of the concern and anxiety uh, sort of speaks to the need for a demystification of what to actually expect with this virus. Now, there's no getting away from the reality that people are going to get infected with this virus. Whether we have a lockdown, level five lockdown, or level two, or level one, or level three lockdown, people are going to get infected, both children as well as adults. The important issue is not about people getting infected, it's about the rate of infection that takes place, right? And that will determine just exactly what sort of consequences are going to be suffered in the country at the macro level. Right. So the first thing that we need to understand is that this is a respiratory virus. And like every other respiratory virus that comes each year, right, roughly about one third of the population are infected each year with influenza. When it comes to RSV, two thirds of children will be infected each year with RSV. This is a respiratory virus. Its modality of transmission is similar to influenza, similar to RSV. So the notion that we can protect and prevent people getting infected, unfortunately, is an unfounded notion. Right? What we need to work towards is ensuring that there's a slowing in terms of the rate of infection. Over a period of two to three years, unless we remain perpetually in level five lockdown, 
right? Two thirds of the population are going to get infected, right? And that two thirds might be one third this year, and then we're going to have a second wave and a third wave. So whatever decisions we make and whatever we're thinking about in terms of how to go about uh, normalizing society needs to be done in a context that this is not a 2020 problem. We're not gonna have a single wave and this virus is going to go away. That is not the reality. We're going to have multiple waves of this virus until there is herd immunity, where roughly about two thirds of the population have been infected, or alternatively, we get a vaccine sooner than that. So I think that's, a, that's an important starting point. Now, in, the, in, in relation to the direct answer to your question, so the first thing what we know, and this is uh, studies that were done in China initially, is that in a household where there's one infected adult, the chances of a child being infected is exactly the same as a child being infected. So in Wuhan, where obviously there's fewer children per household than in South Africa as an example, uh, when there's an infectious case in the household, there's a six to eight percent risk of another member of that household being infected. And that risk is exactly the same between children and adults. The difference is that when children get infected, right, they're much less likely to become symptomatic, or even if they're symptomatic, they're more likely to have just a mild illness compared to adults. So adults that have become infected are more likely to be symptomatic, and depending on their age, depending on other comorbidities, they're more likely to develop severe disease. Right, so there are, so there are differences, but the risk of infection remains the same. Uh, keeping children at home doesn't mean that they're not going to get infected. If those parents are going out to work, they are going to be the ones that are going to be infecting those children in the household. Right, so I think we need to look at it from a macro level. So when children get infected, what do we know? So just give me one second. So like I said, the, the big problem that we face is an issue of needing to demystify uh, this virus. Right, and if you, I, I know this was not to be meant to be a presentation, but I'm going to share one or two slides just to illustrate one or two points. Okay, so you're seeing this, uh, you're seeing this here, and so this is just a background in terms of what I'm talking about. You take 1,000 adults, right? Over a two-year period, what do you expect to happen in that 1,000 adults, right? It's roughly about 60% of people are going to get infected. 40% of people will remain susceptible. So that 60% 60 of those that get infected, obviously 600. Now, of the 600 individuals that are going to get infected, the majority, the majority between 50 to 80%, in this sort of schematic representation, 70% are going to be asymptomatic. They're never going to know that they were infected. Right? And that is happening right now in South Africa. When we do contact tracing, between 50 to 60% of people that are being sampled because the contacts of someone that's infected are completely asymptomatic, but they're actually infected. So 70% of all of the people that become symptomatic are going to be asymptomatic. Of the remaining ones that become ill, that have clinical symptoms, 85% of them, or 25% overall, will basically have a mild self-limiting illness. Right? Very similar to a flu, maybe a bit more severe, but it's a mild self-limiting illness. What we then end up with is roughly about 5% of all of the people that are symptomatic ending up in hospital, and this is above the age of 18, right? And all that's roughly about 26 out of 1,000 adults above the age of 18, and then roughly about five people might die. But that five people differs tremendously by age group. If you take a healthy age group of 18 uh, to 45, you're not gonna get any deaths. If you go above 65, rather than five people dying, you're gonna get 10 people dying. Now, it's a very different story in children, right? And this is the reality. In the thousand children, right? Assuming children are equally susceptible to getting infected as adults, right? We're going to get roughly about two thirds of the children that are infected, that are going to be infected. And that's 600 out of a thousand children under the age of 18. When I'm talking of children now, I'm talking under the age of 18. Okay, of the ones that become symptomatic, of the ones that are infected, the majority, again, are going to be asymptomatic. 70 to 80% are going to be asymptomatic. Of the ones that develop an illness, unlike in adults, where there's about 26 out of 1,000 adults that might end up being hospitalized, in children, we'll be unfortunate if more than one to two children are actually hospitalized out of 1,000 children, right? And we'll be even less fortunate if there's one death out of 1,000 children. And I think this context is important because there's a lot of anxiety on the part of many people in terms of what risk are we exposing to children to right now. In terms, in, in reality, the risk that we are exposing children to right now 
is probably greater to the disadvantage by keeping them locked up at home than allowing them to go back into schools. So, right. so Shabir, let me come in there. Let me ask you some direct questions. The question I'm going to ask you is, is now the right time for children to go to school? But let me ask you some specific questions. Are children at less risk of getting the disease than adults? They're equally likely to be infected. They're less likely to develop severe disease. But they're equally okay, so that was the next question. Is it, so they're at equal risk, but they, they, they're less likely to, to, to develop severe illness. So right. is this the right time for children to be going to school? Well, if you're going to keep the school shut now, then you're going to need, need to keep the school shut, shut till the end of 2021 or 2022 until the vaccine becomes available. And that is a reality we need to face up to, right? That this problem is not going to go away in three to six months, right? Globally, there's a recognition that this is going to play, play out very similarly to the 1918 Spanish flu, when in fact, the second wave of the pandemic was actually worse than the first wave of the pandemic. And the extent to which the second wave will compare to the first wave depends on the non-pharmaceutical interventions that we propose and how effective we are in terms of implementing. Now, we need to understand South Africa is not Singapore, South Africa is not New Zealand, South Africa is not uh, Iceland, right? What allowed those countries to be able to contain the spread of the virus, right? Those realities do not exist in this country at a number of levels, which I'm not going to go into. Right, but even in those countries, we've seen in Singapore, we've seen in South Korea, right, that you need to have an ongoing heightened level of, uh, of surveillance to identify those few cases that are going to emerge suddenly, right, even after you start lifting your lockdown. Right? And those realities, it's, difficult, it's impossible for us to try to aspire to what's been done in New Zealand or South, Singapore or South Korea. We are like the many other countries that need to live with the reality that this virus is with us, it's going to be with us at least for the next two to three years or until a vaccine becomes available. So whatever planning we do, it has to be done in a context that this is not planning for two to three months. So we either open schools now and we might need to close schools in a few months time when there's a huge surge of number of cases and there is going to be a much greater surge of number of cases even in the Western Cape than what exists today. Okay, Shabir. So I think I want to go back to the issue of schools saying that's our main discussion. I think everything you've said is quite important. So if it, my concern is what, from what you're saying is that I'm worried that there's a lot of COVID around currently as a parent, that I'm, I'd rather send my child to school in a month's time when there's less COVID around and there may be less chance of transmission. What's wrong with my thinking like that? Well, your big problem with your thinking is that in two months from now, we're going to have much more COVID than we've got right now. In fact, we might well need to school, close the schools around about the end of August, September, when we really get the surge in terms of uh, the number of cases. So it's a decision that we need to make. We either open schools now, right, or we accept that there's not going to be any schooling this year. We can reassess uh, early next year, but I'll be highly surprised if by March we end up better off than we are now, and if there aren't going to be continuous disruptions for the next two years. Okay, so fine. I say I'm, I'll, I'll bite the bullet and I'll send my child to school next week. What can I expect? How likely is my child to be going to be infected? Your child is probably slightly more likely to get infected than uh, if the child stayed at home and you went to work but came back with the virus because you're obviously in contact with more people. Right, but am I worried about it? The answer is I've got two children and I'm waiting to get them back into school. Right? And the reason for that is not because I'm putting the health at risk, I'm putting the education at risk right now. Right? And the reality is that when they get infected in school, I'm rest assured they're not going to develop a severe illness. For many of the children, right? Uh, the problem we face right now in South Africa is because of the level five lockdown and level four lockdown, what effectively happened in South Africa is that we've been highly successful in terms of not only delaying COVID and SARS coronavirus 2, we probably have also delayed RSV, right? So anyone that's in the practice right okay. now, you know that the number of cases that you've seen of RSV this year or wheezing or bronchitis is about 80% less than you did last year and the previous year. And that's not because RSV has gone away. It's because we've interrupted the transmission of RSV by having the type of measures that we've put into place. So when children go back to school, they're going to be exposed to RSV. Right? Because the community immunity to RSV has actually waned, and that's when RSV usually comes up. They're going to be exposed to influenza. They're going to be exposed to SARS coronavirus too. Now remember, in China, at the peak in Wuhan province itself, at the peak of their epidemic in Wuhan, 
when they tested children that were hospitalized, there were more children, fivefold more children that were being admitted to hospital for respiratory illness that was due to influenza than due to SARS coronavirus 2. Right, so okay, these are children so that were being admitted with LRTI, when they and this was right at the height of the Wuhan epidemic. So it tells us that children can get sick from SARS coronavirus 2, they develop COVID illness. Right? But relative to the risk of developing illness from other respiratory pathogens, it's nominal. Okay, Shabi. So here's the story. So you've convinced me maybe I should send my child. That my child might get COVID, but it's not going to be a serious illness. That's fine. But now the teachers don't want to be there. The, the teachers union are saying we don't think it's safe to be there. And of course, there's a risk that the teachers are at, the, the, the concern is that teachers are at higher risk. How much of a risk are the teachers at? Is it fair to ask teachers to teach my child? Yeah, so there needs to be a risk profiling of the teaching constituency, right? And I'm not suggesting a 65-year-old teacher that's supposed to retire in a few months that's got hypertension and diabetes should go back to school. That would be irresponsible. So there needs to be a risk profiling. But at the same time, we also need to accept that if teachers were to adhere to the principles of NPIs, the non-pharmaceutical interventions, the social distancing, wearing of face masks, hand hygiene, if they were to adhere to that, right, they wouldn't be at any greater risk of being infected in a school compared to being infected outside of a school. Right? What prevents people, what reduces your risk of being infected is not where you are, it's what your behavior is. Right? And that applies to students, that applies to teachers, that applies to everyone else. It's about behavior that determines your risk of becoming infected. Right? The virus is all around. Okay, Shabit, so maybe you can stop sharing your screen so we can see the, our panelists full face. I'm going to ask you one more question before I move on to Fiona. And the question is, okay, so that's teachers, but now children are going to back, go back home and there's Opa there and there's Gogo there. What about the risk to the family? Is that not enough of a reason not to, to send all these children to get infected at school? Uh, so the short answer is, uh, uh, you to make me take off my shirt, a slide share, my slide. So you're gonna <laughs> no, just to talk to each of you. Yeah, so I mean, the, the short answer is uh, the only data we've got, so there's limited data, okay? And I think that's the reality. But there is data from the Netherlands, which did a really good study, which basically looked at when there's a specific age group of individual that's actually infected in the household as, a, in the household as an index case, right? And who, who is that person, not only in, a, in the household, but even more broadly, who is that person more likely to infect? And what they basically found is that it's a linear association, right? Age-related linear association is that people in the same age group are more likely to infect others of that same age group, which doesn't come as a surprise because people of the same age group are more likely to interact with other people of the same age group. What they also showed is that adults are basically infecting adults. Adults are infecting children and children are really, really, really ever infecting adults. Okay, so what's the reason for that? Now, children don't just become asympt develop asymptomatic illness or have a mild illness because of some miracle. There's some underpinning issue in terms of their immunity, which allows them to be able to control the virus in some, such a manner that prevents them from developing severe disease. If their body is not able to control the virus or there might be an issue in terms of the receptors that are required for the virus to cause severe disease. But if that's not in place, children like we see with RSV and everything else will develop severe disease. So what are the possible reasons? One of the possible reasons, right, is that we know if we go in a community right now in Soweto and we sample every child, healthy children in the community, between 12 to 15% of them are going to be infected with coronavirus, not SARS coronavirus 2. They're going to be infected with other coronaviruses that have been circulating since the 1960s. Right. Is it possible that infection with those coronaviruses confers some level of cross protection against SARS coronavirus 2? And the answer to that is very likely, right? especially when they belong to the same sort of family of coronaviruses. So that is one hypothesis. But the reality is that children don't develop severe disease not because of some miracle of nature, but because it's some biological, under, there's some biology underpinning the reduced risk. And it's all related to the immune system or that they might not have these ACE2 receptors or they've got less ACE2 receptors than adults, right? Now by virtue of them not developing severe disease, by inference, it means they're able to contain the virus, right? 
and their viral load. So there aren't studies to look at what is a viral load between. So when children are hospitalized, their viral load is the same as an adult's viral load that's hospitalized. But that's an incorrect comparison in terms of generalizing what happens in a community. Because the child is infected in a community that's got a mild illness and or asymptomatic. We don't know what that child's viral load is in relation to the child that's hospitalized. And in all likelihood, knowing what we're seeing, it's going to be lower. And that means they're less infectious. All right, so I'm going to hold you there and bring Fiona in. What I've heard you say is now is as good as any time to send our children to school, that teachers, if they do the basics right, are not at high risk of getting infected. And there isn't a major risk to everyone at home, including granny and grandpa. Fiona, do you agree with that view? Would you be as willing to send your child to school next week? Yeah, well, if I read the literature, I completely agree with the view. I think if I, I think the biggest risk for primarily, the biggest fear for any parent. Fiona, sorry, it's Mignon. Do you mind just speaking up a little bit so we can just hear you? Sorry, can you hear me better now? Not really. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Now, I totally agree with Shabir. Um, I mean, I'm not nearly as an expert as he is or know all the data that he does. But from the literature that I have read, I agree with everything that he has said. And I agree that schools should be reopened. And I agree that the vast majority of healthy children should return to school. Um, I think the biggest fear for any parent is around death ultimately, because that's the worst outcome for every parent. And again, I think it's important, as Shabir said, that we must put the data into a context so that parents and us can actually understand what it really means, because a number is just a number, but we have to, I believe, put it in a relative risk to what was the risk last year in June for a child to go back to school or to be in a school. You know, if you look at the uh, US data, in the same period of the COVID now in America, there were nine reported deaths related to COVID, but the total child mortality was 31,500 children died in the same period of time. So COVID contributed 0.03% to the deaths of the children in America. So I think that the sad thing is children do die each year, every day of various reasons. And I do not think the risk for death for children this winter is higher than it was last winter. So I guess the question is, is there a group or is there some children that may fall in a different uh, risk category to that generalized statement? And there the data is not um, very helpful. I mean, there is some data, but the comorbidities in children is much less um, clear and much less um, published as in adults. And probably because in the, in, to begin with, we see so few children or less, far less children than adults. Um, and therefore, it's difficult to really tease out wh which underlying conditions is a risk factor. There is one study from the US uh, that, con that had laboratory confirmed cases, around the 350 cases. And of them, a quarter of them had underlying conditions. And I don't think there's any surprises in that list. We are used to that list for many other viral respiratory illnesses, such as chronic lung disease, cardiovascular disease, immunosuppression, uh, chronic kidney disease, liver disease, diabetes and then neurological conditions. But again, I don't think there is anything surprising on that list. That's exactly the same children we would have been concerned about last winter for RSV or influenza. And the one that, that, that's commonly asked is asthma. What about asthma? Yeah, again, I mean, like any other asthma patient, then we, I mean, that's such a common condition, but the long and the short is if your asthma is well controlled, your risk for a severe exacerbation when you get a rhinovirus or a RSV or influenza is obviously far less than when your asthma is not well controlled. Or if you have severe asthma and you are on high doses of, of medication to control your asthma, you might be more likely to have an asthma exacerbation. But I'm not sure that you necessarily have an increased risk 
for the type of interstitial pneumonitis that is associated with COVID. Just because you have an airway disease doesn't make you more susceptible, I think, biologically for an interstitial pneumonitis. So I think there is a lot of this is based on assumptions that we've known about with influenza and RSV and adenovirus and rhinovirus. But I honestly don't think the data is out there that actually supports our gut feeling yet. But I think it's reasonable to assume that those children might be at higher risk. And so in those okay. groups, I would suggest individualizing. Right. So, so I'm, I'm going to welcome chat line questions. The question now is what about cystic fibrosis? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, again, there has very, I haven't seen any specific publications, um, but what I have heard um, word by mouth from North American centers and European centers is that they actually haven't seen uh, CF patients come in with COVID exacerbations. You know, even, you know, big CF clinics like Sickets and in Toronto haven't had a single CF patient admitted with COVID. Um, okay, finally, so what about children attending special needs school? Any, any reason to be concerned there? I think it comes down, obviously, to the behavior of the children and how, how the children are able to follow certain interventions. And it might be very difficult for them to wear a mask, for example, or necessarily to understand, to keep to social distancing. But they can still wash their hands. And, um, you know, so I don't think that from a from a point of view that they are at greater risk to develop severe infection. I don't think we have any data. They might, due to their behavior, like Shabir said, have a slightly higher risk for infection. Um, but okay. I don't think they have a higher risk for serious symptoms. Okay, thanks Fiona. So the list, there's a few more questions, but we're going to move on from this question. So there's questions about what about diabetes? What about uh, uh, previous heart condition. I'm not, I, I think we must move on. I'm sure this, we can answer that at another time. Now, I'm not sure whether Dr. Archery is still with us because he had another teleconference. Mo, you still there? Can you take a question now? So, Mo, the question is, and, and Shabir, unfortunately, is going to have to leave us in 10 minutes, but let me ask you this question. So, it seems from the other two panelists that Tabos has to go to school next week. He's on his way. Now I'm worried, what do I have to do? And so we've had lots of questions. What kind of social distancing? What kind of mask? Is there a good mask to have? What else must I do to make sure my child is safe? And then what does the school have to do to make sure that my child is actually going to be protected? What's your advice? Mm -hmm. I think the things are, I think the first thing is to say that uh, the difficulty is that there's no direct evidence uh, in terms of interventions that work. Uh, from specifically around COVID-19. Um, however, we can look at, at other countries in terms of what they've implemented, in terms of the uh, processes that they've gone about, in terms of keeping schools open and reopening of schools. So if you take the example um, of Sweden, and Sweden went the route of not closing schools at all. Um, and they put into place uh, quite uh, simple measures uh, to maintain the school functioning with very simple things to, to keep it going. And I'll go through some of the, the aspects that they, uh, they did. So, uh, and what they found at the end, uh, it really didn't impact on the overall epidemic in terms of the numbers of infections that occurred. And even when they looked at the seroprevalence rates at the end of the epidemic, and they're coming to the end of it, the seroprevalence rates was about six point something percent in adults and about four point something percent in children. So really, this issue of children being, even but if they But just school, to be argumentative, there's evidence of a school in Sweden where there were 500 yeah. children and 18 of the teachers out of a staff of 76 actually ended up with COVID. So they, they, that's one of the ones yeah. quoted about how teachers might be at risk. But anyway, that's just being argumentative. Let's get on to what you're suggesting the protection should be. Okay, so I think the one, first thing is, I think one thing is to say that what, what are the things that we definitely know should not be recommended? Uh, so the things that are that should not be recommended is uh, the issues of uh, spray tunnels, uh, human spraying, uh, and there's enough evidence to show that this is harmful for children and increased risk of uh, respiratory uh, affectation, uh, uh, skin irritation, eye irritation. So those 
uh, fancy uh, spray uh, tunnels that, that some of the schools have, have, uh, have uh, put onto the media is really something that we should, as pediatricians, warn against in terms of being harmful to children and surely, surely should be uh, discouraged. Uh, similarly, environmental spraying uh, uh, hasn't been shown uh, and fogging uh, of the environment uh, really hasn't been shown to decrease uh, transmission rates and also there's contamination of the, of the environment and, and, and the disinfectants that are used in those uh, uh, sprays, often we don't know what they are and they could be causing harm to children. So the uh, things that we should be saying, the first thing and the most important thing is to prevent uh, or, or not allow uh, symptomatic individuals who are ill to enter the school system. And that includes both children and staff. Um, and, and really- the and how would you do that, Mo? What does that mean? How would you exclude kids that you think are at risk? So risk the difficulty is one is, is uh, and the one issue is fever, is, is, uh, has, a, has quite a low pred positive predictive value. Uh, so if you look at the literature, only about 50% of, of the presenting symptoms, as Shabir said, many children are asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly many of the symptoms don't occur in children. So the one thing that, and again from the, the Sweden model was that uh, if your child is in any way sick, uh, do not send them to school. Um, okay. And I think that should so, be so Mo, let me ask you some more direct yeah. questions. So for those who are who are on the call, open the chat because Professor Madi is offering comments on some of the issues so that yeah. I don't have to ask him that, but he's offering comments. So Mo, let's get on to the issue of the mask. So what's what's your sense of what kind of mask? And the fear of, of, of everyone is that children will not keep masks, particularly the younger kids. So what kind of a mask are you suggesting be used? So the thing is, so the, the general rule of thumb is that we're suggesting the use of cloth masks. Um, and particularly the reasoning behind that is actually it's uh, to prevent the uh, spread or, or, or uh, to contamination of the environment uh, and limiting that. Um, certainly, I think the, the limitation is that uh, as many people have indicated, there is some uh, lower age group at which that could not, that can't be, uh, can't be used. And certainly, you know, we're not expecting a two-year-old to wear a uh, cloth mask. And there are alternatives, uh, and uh, the, the use of face shields are alternatives to the use of, of cloth masks. So the one thing is cloth masks for everyone, and particularly in areas where they are in, in close contact uh, and closed environments. So in the school, in the, in the classroom itself. Um, and certainly, I think, we, you know, we're going to have to be slightly uh, flexible to allow children uh, to, 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 to not use it when they, uh, in, in certain times of the day, because it does become restrictive uh, over time. So I think, you know, working our way to try and see how we can best uh, manage that situation, but particularly okay. around... So I'm going to call Shabir in just now, but prison. tell us a little bit about social distancing. Everyone's kind of very weary that children are going to social distance. Is, is that possible? And does it matter if they don't social distance? So I think the one thing in terms of social distancing is trying to limit the, uh, I mean, the, the physical distancing issue in terms of how do you space the class out and, and especially in closed environments. Um, so certainly I think that you can do in a structured school environment where you can space the, uh, the, the, the desks out and, and the recommendation. Um, although we've recommended 1.5 meters, the WHO is recommending one meter. Um, so that can be can be done. Um, the other thing is is decreasing the opportunity to not social distance, uh, and that comes from staggering of uh, lunch breaks, staggering of other break times uh, for children, and staggering the start and, and uh, uh, end time of, of school. So I think trying to be innovative in terms of trying to limit the times at which large numbers of children uh, congregate um, uh, at, in, in large numbers overall uh, can go towards getting that social distancing uh, uh, program. So, so Mo, one last question before I go back to Shabir. The minister has promised that there will be water available to schools. I'm not convinced that that can, that can be delivered by next week. So if there are schools without hand washing, children not to go to back to those schools or can we live with the fact that there may not be water at schools? 
So I think the, the, certainly I think there does need to be uh, uh, you know, facilities to do hand washing. If there's no facilities to hand wash, uh, alternatives uh, should be looked at and the use of alcohol-based hand rubs is another alternative to that. Um, so, but I think, you know, certainly I think alcohol-based alcohol hand rubs um, is, is, is useful where there's not gross contamination of the hand, but certainly uh, that both uh, options should be available. Um, and that's particularly uh, uh, pre and post going to the, uh, using the, the, the uh, toilets and also before eating should be one of the areas uh, where we should be recommending hand washing as well. Um, from our discussions with the Department uh, of uh, Basic Education, I think they've, they've put into place many of the structures to get uh, uh, water uh, available as, uh, as to as many schools as possible. Um, so I think they seem to be quite confident that uh, you know, facilities to, for children to wash hands will be available for, for children. Okay, Mo, so I, I recognize you need another call. Please stay on if you can, but I'm going to pass the baton on to Shabir. So Shabir, you've heard Mo's views. Is there anything you agree with? Is there something you want to stress that perhaps people have got wrong? I know you often find issue with things that, that sound obvious, but perhaps shouldn't be obvious. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Mo, but I don't know, again, I mean, I think, so I think some of the comments on the chat group are really pertinent. And I mean, we need to move away from the idea. And the sooner we do so, the better for everyone uh, that we're going to prevent children from getting infected. Okay, uh, we've never been able to prevent children from getting infected with RSV or influenza, which causes more children to die. Right, so let us just look at the numbers for what it is. Right, right now, of what the number sitting at 300,000 people that have died, right, there's not more than, there's not, it's not even, it's just less than 100 children that have died. In Italy, where there were 30,000 deaths on the 1st of May, there were zero children that died. Okay, so children are going to get infected and we need to accept they're gonna get infected and there's no getting away from it, whatever we do, right? It's just a matter of what is the risk of developing severe disease and that is what needs to go out. Parents need to understand, physicians, healthcare workers need to understand that there is a nominal risk in terms of developing severe disease and there's even a less risk in terms of dying. So unfortunately, when we get a two-day-old child that's born to a mother that's COVID-19 that dies, right? Did that child die from COVID-19? We don't know. There were a whole lot of other things happening, right? If you, in New York, as an example, when they randomly sampled all women that were delivering, right? They found that 15% of all of the women that were delivering were infected with sars coronavirus too. Out of that 15, out of that 15 percent, 85 percent of them were completely asymptomatic. Right. So mothers are on a daily basis being infected, and their children are going to be exposed to them knowingly or unknowingly. But we don't see large numbers of children anywhere in the world, young infants, neonates, actually dying from COVID-19, which means that there's something that's happening that's protecting children from developing severe disease. So. If the starting point is we don't want our children to get infected, then like I said, keep the schools shut for the next two to three years. But that so, can't be the starting point of the discussion. Okay, so, so this case, this, this is probably going to go to the court. So let's say this is the scenario that a, a school, there's 60 children per classroom, there's no water and sanitation, there's very little prospect of hand sanitizer, the taxi to school is going to be completely crowded. I used, on your argument, you would say, that's still fine. The kids must go to school because eventually they're going to get infected. And so let their education go. And if they get sick, that's fine. I, are you willing to push it that far? Yeah, there needs to be a risk-benefit uh, analysis. And right now, that poor child in a rural area that's not going to school is being deprived of nutrition because he's not getting access to the food parcels that he should be getting each day. Right? So there needs to be a risk-benefit analysis. And what I'm arguing is right now, in terms of the risk-benefit analysis, children are being put at greater risk from a number of perspectives, right, than any sort of meaningful benefit by being kept at homes and by being deprived of immunization services, of food parcels, of education, and the list goes on, right? So there needs to be a meaningful risk benefit analysis in terms of what it is and what are we trying to achieve. This is the first time where children are being protected, but we're actually harming children by actually keeping them back. We're actually punishing children, despite them not being at risk of developing severe illness, but we're punishing them in a number of ways. 
Okay, so let's go to the other scenario. I've given you the worst scenario. The best scenario is I go to a private school. There are 15 children in school. I've, I'm going to wear a mask. Is it meaningful? I mean, it, it makes sense. If you can prevent your child from being infected, that's great. Can I, pre can I prevent my child from getting infected? Is it possible in the environment, both in school and outside, that I can somehow be among those children who after two years are still not infected? Because I really don't want even a mild disease in my child. Is that something that's feasible? I mean, I'm asking hypothetical yeah, it's feasible, questions. It's feasible if you put your child in a bubble and keep the child in a bubble both at home as well as school, you might achieve that. But other than doing that, you're not going to achieve it. So children are going to get infected even if they're at home. If parents are going out to work, right? If there's other people that are coming to visit in that house, children are going to get infected, right? So there's no avoiding preventing people getting infected. There are opportunities in terms of reducing the risk of being infected or preventing the, or sort of spreading out the period of time over which people will get infected. But there's no opportunity to, there's no resource that we've got available to us other than to be at level five for the next five years, right? Until the vaccine becomes available to prevent children from getting infected. Okay, so I'm going to ask for you. So Shabir, Mo, you can look at some of the questions in the chat and perhaps take them if you want. There's anything that catches your eye. But Fiona, what's, what would be your advice then to a parent, say, a middle class family going to a government school or a private school? How, how would you provide advice? What are you telling your, page, your parents and your patients? Yeah, thanks for that question. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, well, I'm telling all my parents that children without serious underlying comorbidities and with serious, I mean, they either have a serious immunodeficiency, a serious structural cardiac disease or lung disease that is not well controlled, um, or a chronic kidney disease or uncontrolled diabetes. I'm telling those people to be cautious, but I'm still telling them to, as Shabir suggested, you have to do a risk benefit analysis for your household and your family. And you need to take that decision against the background of understanding that you're not making a decision for the next month or the next two months. You're making a decision at least for the end, till the end of the year and early next year. And you have to look at, is it feasible and is it appropriate for your family and your household to keep that child lock up at home. And there are some of my families who say, well, you know, everything is sorted. The child is happy as Larry. We have homeschooling. We have all the facilities. Mum is at home overseeing the whole process. The child loves being at home, is in a good routine. Then great for you. Then maybe you're one of the lucky ones. But the vast majority of other people, their circumstances is such that either the child is actually not accessing uh, appropriate education at home or both parents have to work or um, there isn't any serious underlying condition and that I believe is the majority of households and in that situation again if you weigh up risks to benefit my question is what is significantly different for the child this winter versus last winter and if that risk was acceptable to you last winter why is it not acceptable to you this winter? And, and in those households where there is really, really vulnerable people and you want to try and keep the circle as close as possible, then I, I think we should also allow people to make that decision for themselves and not become draconic with our measures. But okay, let me ask some general questions and then we'll try and wrap up. We've got about 10 more minutes, even though we started a bit late. And I, but I know Professor Madi. So any of the three of you can take these questions. So the first question would be, uh, what, and Fiona, let me, maybe you, because you've got the mic. What about sports at school? Yeah, again, I mean, I think it is, it is a concern because obviously the moment you have a group sport, there's going to not be social distancing. And maybe that's a big step for parents to make at this point in time. But I would argue that if you play tennis and you can probably still play tennis with the, the opponent across the net, um, or if you do individual sports, it may still be able to, to do that. Um, but I think for, for most parents, that's a bit of a stretch, but I would hope that physical activity, it may not be competitive sport, but that physical activity for children is definitely part of going back to school. 
And okay, thanks, Fiona. Mo, I should be this question to you. So we open schools and we start finding that either the, 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 the children or teachers have uh, developed COVID. How big does the outbreak have to be before you start thinking we better close the school? Or is it something we say, mm -mm, it's going to happen, Shabir, your argument, school remains open, doesn't matter 10 kids or 50 kids got COVID, education goes on. From an epidemiological point of view, is there a critical number where we'll say, ah, ah schools must close again, Shabir? Yeah, so I don't know if I answer that. Uh, just to, uh, in terms of one of the issues that Fiona sort of mentioned, I think it's important to have extracurricular activities, but at the same time, I think it might be premature to introduce extracurricular activities immediately now. I think when going back to schools, there needs to be a rationalization in terms of the curricula and the amount of time that uh, is going to be spent in school. And there needs to be a minimization in terms of the possibility of a close contact. So even during breaks, uh, children shouldn't be gathering together and sharing lunch and kissing each other and hugging each other. So in fact, in the first two days of school, the only thing that should be thought, taught to the students is about what this virus is all about and how can we protect ourselves and hopefully the children become vectors of transmission of knowledge to their parents rather than vectors of transmission of the virus. So, uh, I, and I think that's really important. So I think we need to be a bit guarded. I wouldn't say just open up the schools and allow things to be back to normal. So now I've forgotten the question you asked. So what if there's an outbreak in the school? What, how, do, how will we define an outbreak in this kind of setting? And what, what will make us decide to close the school again? It's a theoretical question, but it's likely to happen. And it's something we're going to face. How would we approach this issue? So, so we, again, so I think Mo already mentioned that what we need to do is that uh, even though there's a very low likelihood that a child that is symptomatic with respiratory illness, yes, actually got SARS coronavirus, is more likely to have influenza or RSV or rhinovirus, uh, those children shouldn't be going to school. So if a child is symptomatic, they shouldn't be going to school. And we need to be pragmatic. We can't be screening every child every second or third day. Neither can we do that amongst the teachers, right? And for me, I think the, the bigger risk in terms of there being an outbreak in a school is the behavior of the teachers rather than the behavior of the children. Right? The, the, child, the, the teachers are going to be the ones that are going to be introducing virus into the schools. And the behavior of the teachers means that the teachers need to adhere to the NPIs. The teachers can't be gathering into tea rooms. They can't be gathering into staff meetings into a close uh, in one little room. Right? So it's really, the, for me, I think the critical issue at school in schooling, in fact, is the behavior of the teachers. Because like Mo mentioned in Sweden, and you cited that example in Sweden, you had all of these teachers that were infected, but no children. Right? So what does it tell us? It tells us is that the teachers are that are infecting each other because of their behavior. Okay. So in terms of how to respond to an outbreak, uh, we need to accept people are going to get infected in schools. Does that mean that we need to shut schools? Yes, we need to shut schools if we start, see a sudden dramatic change in terms of this epidemic and we end up seeing huge numbers of children that are hospitalized, right, which is very unlikely to occur. Okay, thanks, Shabir. So we're going to wrap up in about three minutes. Mo, I see you still there. I know you serve on the Ministerial Advisory Committee on COVID, and I know the committee has is, is making recommendations about schooling. Is there anything that we've said today that hasn't been covered yet that would be part of those recommendations? You probably, well, I don't know whether you're able to, 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 to share with us what the, exactly the guidelines say, but perhaps are there any things you want to highlight that's likely to come in and advise that, that you have advised the, the minister that hasn't been covered yet? Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think these are, so when we looked at the literature, again, I think these were may, you know, largely uh, based on what's, what's the literature available. And certainly I think it's very clear that uh, the, the likelihood of children having severe disease is extremely, extremely low. And the uh, risks in terms of the, COVID, the, the issues that the children have to bear with in terms of uh, other issues that they have to uh, uh, receive with, with not going to school is far higher. Uh, so the, the recommendation is that, that children should return to school and that should be done in a way that would protect both children but also the, 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 the school environment and, and teachers in it. Um, and many of those uh, protections that we've, we spoke about and, and what Shabir spoke about in terms of, of teachers, uh, you know, uh, congregating and, all of, and social distancing they are, are included into that guideline. So I think the, the main thing is uh, we, we want schools to be open because it's good for children. 
secondly, uh, we want to do it in a responsible way. And certainly, I think the, the one thing is that, we, you know, I think there's a lot of uh, anxiety that we need to accept both in terms of, uh, of parents and also children as well. Um, and, and we need to take both the, the parents, children and the community along with us uh, as we get buy in into uh, return to school. Thank you, Mo. I see there's one question that I haven't, it says something about national guidelines suggest screening of all learners and teachers twice a week. I, is there any point in screening in, a, in the school setup? I'm not sure what, nation, what these guidelines are. I haven't seen these. So certainly I think there's no, uh, uh, so I say there's a difference between screening and testing. Um, so certainly I think we're saying that you should be regularly screening yourself in terms of if you have symptoms of the disease, then you do not come into uh, the school. And that, and that really should be done you know, once a day. Uh, so every morning a parent should be screening their child for symptoms. And if they are uh, symptomatic or, or uh, they feel that they're symptomatic, they shouldn't send them to school. Similarly- Okay, school. yeah. Of course, we're not talking about testing of any sort. All right, so I think time to wrap up. So I'm gonna allow each of, each of you to perhaps just give a final message for about two minutes or so. Fiona, any comments from your side? No, no, I just wanted to say, I, I mean, I think all of us, and that's probably why we struggle to get everybody on this meeting, um, we share concerns, we share, and we, on every single day, we hear parents' fears, and it sounds like the pediatric community per se also has a lot of fear. So I think we, we do need, we have a responsibility as a pediatric community to spread accurate data and to put things in the right context so that everybody can understand it and to see it as a relative risk relative to other situations relative to last winter rather than this completely separate absolute risk that we've never dealt with before because that helps to allay fears and that helps people to make rational decisions. Thank you very much, Fiona. Shabir, you need to leave soon. Any parting words from you? I see you've been responding to some of the comments on the chat. I do apologize to participants for not answering the participants, the panelists, all your questions. There's been quite a lot, but at least Shabir has been answering some so you can see his responses. But Shabir, some parting words from you about this whole scenario. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't have much else to add. I, I, I'm just seeing some uh, comments on this R naught and RT and effective reproductive rate. And the only thing I would caution against is uh, one of the biggest challenges that we face with COVID-19, right, is the huge volume of data that's become available over a short period of time, most of which has not been adequately peer reviewed. And that's the reason we see a huge number of articles being retracted in the scientific literature. Right? And this is a time to understand that you need to be critical in terms of how you go about interpreting data. There's an article that you shared with me from Germany as an example, which indicated that children were as likely to be infecting uh, infectious as adults. And another group took the same data set and did a reanalysis and basically showed that those conclusions were completely wrong. Right? And we just need to be careful how we approach it and we need to be measured. And at the end of the day for me, we need to act in the interest of children. And right now, children are getting the short end of the stick in terms of the COVID response at a, public, at a national level. Thank you, Shabir. Mo, any last words from you? You just need to unmute yourself, please. Um, so I think I, I just agree with everything that's been said. And I think just, um, I think my last word would be I think the, one of the issues that we haven't spoken about is the anxiety that's um, actually been left with children. Um, you know, many children feel anxious about going to school um, and fearful of, uh, of the consequences and, and other issues. So I think, you know, as we discuss this, we shouldn't, uh, you know, leave uh, students or, or, or children out of this. And also, you know, discussing and encouraging parents to discuss these issues and, and, and having them to understand uh, that they're not going to bring this infection and kill grandmother at home, uh, which is a perception that's, that's quite prevalent uh, in social media at the moment. Thank you, Moe. So to summarize, it seems like our panelists are quite, I would use the word belligerent, that unlike the South African public, unlike uh, many of the teachers unions, pediatricians, our panelists seem to have a different view. 
and, and seem to be quite keen to get children back to school. I think what I've heard this afternoon is firstly, that we know children are less likely to transmit, that they may pose a risk to teachers, they may pose a risk to their families at home, but that's not going to be an unduly high risk, um, recognizing that there's more data will certainly help. I think we heard from Fiona that there's actually very few categories of children that uh, need to be automatically excluded from school. We heard about the usual cardiorespiratory conditions, maybe immunosuppressive, but generally the other groups, and there was a whole lot of other questions about pregnant teachers and what if my child is allergic. And I think none of those have come up as being strong enough reasons to keep ch children out of school. And then we had a little bit of discussion of the kind of worst scenario that schools where many of these things can't be happening, whether it's social distancing, whether it's the hygiene aspects. And I think what I heard the panelists saying is that, in fact, despite that, uh, they would still be recommending that children go to school, that it, it's less than optimal, but uh, on a risk benefit ratio, even in those suboptimal conditions, children are probably still better off at school. And then I think we, we had some discussion about how the school environment and individual children could be safe. And we had some good examples about the kind of masks that are needed. Nothing extraordinary, I heard. Cloth masks, uh, that social distancing is to be practiced as best we can, recognizing it may be difficult. But even if that breaks down, uh, the overall view is that it's not as dangerous as perhaps many parents and certainly the unions think. I hope I've summarized correctly what our panelists say. They, I'd be happy for them to say, ah, you got us wrong. But I certainly think it's the, the kind of approach we've presented this afternoon is saying, let's get on with it, which is not, I think, the current perception in, in the public. And there were some comments on the chat saying, maybe we need to get our panelists onto national media to be saying these things and to, to be encouraging parents to go to school. I'm going to let Minion give the final word, but I think what SAPA, the South African Pediatric Association, would probably what should do and, and would hopefully do in the next two or three days is actually give a statement, a public statement. About... <laughs> hey, Firdosa, then please put off your mic. No, no. <laughs> Firdosa, please put off your mic. And I think it behoves us as the pediatric community to be to say what we think the evidence base is on this and to be able to give some set of recommendations. The Ministerial Advisory Committee clearly have got views, but those haven't been made public. And I would hope that based on today's uh, webinar, we might be able to put a document together that says that. So as facilitator, I'm, I'll stop there and pass the, the baton back to Mignon in Cape Town. But to all the participants, the panelists, my deep thanks. They they, they, they had other commitments that they didn't do. Thank you very much for a, a very informative session. And to everybody else who stayed on the course, the 300, uh, thank you very much for, 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 for being there with us and despite our troubles, hanging in there. But perhaps Minion can have the last word. Minion? Thank you. Thank you, Haroon. And thank you to everybody. Haroon, this was your brainchild. Thank you for putting it together. And thanks to our panelists. Really fantastic. I like your fan club, I'll uh, dial in in future and we will try and increase our capacity next time. For those who missed it, we're hoping that our SAPA Facebook page will have this recording available. So just give us a day or two to get that sorted. And for those of you who received it by email, we'll try and forward it to you as well. But um, hopefully that was a very practical session. Thank you for supporting SAPA. Thank you to those parents out there. And uh, I think we need to do what's best for kids. And that is what SARP is all about, is striving for thriving kids. Thank you, everybody, and good night. <clears throat>